and you chair the Prairies Committee, right? Yeah. So again, welcome everybody. Glad to see the turnout. Um, pretty good, actually. You know, we usually see 15, 20, 30 people. So that's always uh, a kind of a number that we look for. So this is this good turnout. So today, um, because we're at a hardware facility, I wanted to talk about hardware standards, uh, substituting hardware, kind of what you can expect if you're doing that, and um, a very high level um, about what the rules are. So um, that obviously doesn't fill an hour. So I've got a couple other things in there that we're going to talk about that I thought might be of interest um, for you guys today. So we're going to talk about NAFS uh, 2017 equivalency documents. Uh, we're going to talk about the hardware requirements, like I just said, door hardware, um, component substitutions, uh, WOCDs, window opening control devices. Uh, some pretty big news about that. Um, the Alberta Code Adoption Timeline, um, the 2025 NBC uh, Energy Star Participant uh, Agreement Update. If you haven't seen it and you're in Energy Star, there's things in there that you're going to want to make note of. Uh, and then the FinCAN Online Forum, I push it at every event that I go to to try and get participation in that. So um, NAFS 2017, so the next Alberta Building Code. It's going to be based on the NBC 2020 that published last March. And in there, it references NAFS 2017. So that's what you're going to have to um, have your products uh, tested to. So uh, there's the JDMG, which is the joint, joint, the joint document management group. Uh, it's a three-party group that is um, um, made up of uh, members from CSA, uh, FGIA, and WDMA. And that group... Um, basically uh, updates NAFs and, and manages the NAFs document. Um, the, any changes that come through, uh, they have committees that work on those and uh, try and keep it at least reasonably uh, easy to understand. Um, so uh, within, uh, within that, there's um, um, equivalency documents that outline the changes from version to version. Uh, really great to understand what those are because they can have an impact to how you're going to test what you're going to test, what, what's going to be compliant as you move forward. So um, NAFS uh, 2008 and 2011 and 2017 are referenced in Bulletin uh, 1801. Uh, that's available off the WDMA website. I, I think it's on FGI's, FGIA's website as well and other places that you can find it if you do some Google searching. Uh, so the equivalency document for NAFS 22 is just about ready. Um, I sit on that group on the CSA side. Um, there's a lot of great stuff in there that explain the changes, and we should see that published very, very soon. It was with the legal folks making sure that there was nothing in there that was problematic. So you should see that soon. Um, so NAFS 22 is published, uh, but it's not referenced in the 2020 NBC. I've had some inquiries from some members about, well, should I test the 2020? You can, but if your jurisdiction is enforcing 17, which is in the building code, you need to make sure that whatever you test under NAFS 22 is also the same in NAFS 17. Then you can get away with it and your lab can help you to figure that out. And uh, you can also have test reports written that say uh, compliant to 17 or 22. So just be sure which one you're testing to when you do your work and uh, what's being enforced in your area. There's even guys that are still enforcing 11 out there. So it's good to know what, what's, uh, what's happening in your area. Uh, so with all NAFS versions, there's component hardware requirements. Uh, the stuff I'm going to talk about today is strictly out of NAFS 17. Again, there could be changes from 11 and 22, but I'm only talking about 17, which is going to be the one that's referenced in uh, the building code. So standards progression. Um, it, it's interesting that um, the uh, GDMG does these equivalency documents, because if you look at the back of NAFS, there's actually standards progression tables. So a lot of that information is already there, right? So at the end of NAF 17 in Annex D, uh, there's several pages that provide tables of changes from eight through 11 through 17. And you can see, um, you know, there's the column for 08, column for 11, column for 17, what it refers to, and then um, the changes that, um, that either have happened or haven't happened. And that's not moving, right? So you can see, for example, performance grade tables, those didn't change between 8 and 11, but there are changes in 17. So that's a great place to look to understand what the changes are uh, right within the NAFS document. Come on, how come we're not moving? Oh, here we go. 
So hardware standards in 17, so hardware material. So hardware shall be of, so this, all this stuff is taken directly out of NAFs. So um, a lot of it, a lot of it people don't know because they haven't read NAFs. And a lot of it is um, not enforced anywhere, but it's in NAFs and it can be enforced. If you come across a building official that knows the ins and outs of NAFs, you could be hooked on one of these things where you haven't done your work to comply. And not all labs focus on this stuff either, right? So hardware should be of corrosion resistant material compatible with the material to which the hardware is being applied. For example, you're anchoring a hinge through, um, what's a hinge bar made of? Stainless steel? And you're using a screw that's incompatible or not compatible? That could be problematic. If your customer comes back a year later and says, look, all my screws are rusting away in the hinges. Oh, well, what kind of screw did they use? Is it compatible? You could end up being on the hook to deal with that because you didn't follow this requirement. Uh, so uh, isolated steel, other than stainless steel, if you use, shall comply with the requirements of AMA 907 and ANSI BH BHMA 156.18. I haven't read those. I don't know who has read them, but it's things that you need to be aware of if you're dealing with compatible issues, compatibility issues between materials. All hardware shall be serviceable or replaceable in the field. The definition of serviceable is in NAFs, so accessible without major reconstruction of the window, door, secondary storm panel, tubular data lighting device, roof window, unit skylights. So you have to be able to, to take that part and replace it, right? You don't, you, you can't rip the product apart to get to something, which I've actually had products that we designed that were like that. So something to be aware of. Lead content, again, not a huge thing that we think about when we're selecting or finding hardware from wherever it might be, there's requirements for the lead content in products. So at the point of manufacture, fenestration product, the outermost surface of a test samples of hardware intended for repetitive human touch. So if it's something like a tie bar where, you know, you're not touching it, we're talking about handles and, you know, different levers or whatever, right? So um, uh, if it installed in conditions shall be tested for the pre presence of lead in accordance with ASTM E1753, which is the test um, standard. And then brass and bronze, which are typically what you're going to run into for components that you're touching, right? The hardware, door handles, et cetera, things like that. Test method B, only be used when touchable surface tested as listed in table 11. Complete hardware part that's indicated the presence of lead in accordance with clause 112121 shall be supplied to the lab. Supplied sample should be prepared for analysis in accordance with the EPA method 3050B and then analyzed in accordance with the following test. I mean, you need to de deal with this if you're dealing with hardware that has the potential of lead in it. So be, be aware, right? So if you look at specifically brass, they're brass and bronze, there's very specific levels that those materials have to meet in order for you to be able to use them. And everybody knows the danger of lead, so it's something that we want to make sure that we pay attention to. <clears throat> so 11.2.3 out of NAFs, hung window hardware. So primary window sash should be equipped with counterbalancing mechanisms meeting AMA 902 or 908. Counterbalancing mechanisms of appropriate size and capacity to hold the sash stationary in any position. And we've all come across those situations where somebody on the floor put the wrong balances in, you know, lift it up and it falls down or it won't stay at a certain spot. And your client's like, well, you know, this thing doesn't work. Well, yeah, well, whatever. You have to do that. You have to make sure that they can put it anywhere in its travel and it'll stay in that space. Casement awning hopper and projected window hardware, kind of similar. Each sash should be provided with hardware capable of supporting it in any open position or have friction hinges. There's a lot of guys out there that build windows without roto operators and they use the regular hinge. They don't put a friction hinge in, the thing swings like a flag in the wind. You can't do that. It's, that's something that you're not able to do. And if a client comes back and starts complaining and you're like, no, 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 that's the way it is. If they happen to be smart enough to go and look at the standard, you're gonna be on the hook to deal with that. Rotary operators, linear operators uh, comply with 901, friction hinges comply with 904. So again, these components need to meet the requirements of these AMA standards. Um, I don't know them off by heart. Um, I have some, I don't have them all. Most of them you have to pay for, um, usually not a whole lot of cost. But if you're concerned about the hardware that you're gonna buy, 
you know, you go to your supplier and say, okay, well, these are the standards that hardware needs to meet. Show me that you've met that. And they should have some test data on uh, the compliance to those to those standards. This is one that uh, that nobody thinks about. I certainly never thought about it. So the reduction of number of latching devices on units smaller than the tested specimen shall be permitted if substantiated by acceptable engineering calculations. So you've tested a 60 inch tall casement, you have a three point tie bar on it, and you build the window at three feet and you put a one point on it. You can't do that unless it's been engineered. I don't, everybody does it. And you know, I, I don't know that there's a huge problem with that. Most guys have pretty good systems that'll that'll do what they need to do. But if your client comes back and says, well, you know, my, the top of my window is blowing out, my casement's blowing out because it's got one latch on it. Well, you better be prepared to back up that you have some engineering calculations behind that. You can't simply say, well, here's my five foot tall casement test with a three, three latch tie bar. Doesn't fly, that, it's, it's not compliant. And if you get a client that's smart enough to understand where to look or a building official maybe that wants to challenge you on whether or not that's compliant, uh, it's something you're gonna need to deal with. 11262, sliding door hardware. Uh, so movable sliding door panels should be fitted with rollers and roller assemblies that are uh, comply or conforming to 906. Rollers and roller assemblies shall be designed to provide easy movement, adequately support the sliding door panel without deforming. Corrosion resistance of hardware components comply to 907. So same thing, those, those products need to be able to comply to that AMA standard for the corrosion testing. Something else uh, that in my former life, we, we got caught on for lack of a better way of putting it, rollers and latching devices shall be adjustable to ensure the proper fit and operation. There's a number of lift and slide door systems out there where the rollers aren't adjustable. There you are what they are, they lift and they drop. That's all they do. If you get into a situation where maybe you're on a, on a project where you're running into site testing and you can't adjust those, and somebody happens to know that, well, they have to be adjustable, you're gonna have a problem with that product and that client. So they have to be adjustable. I don't know what the solution is, I'm not a hardware guy, or if there's lift and slide hardware out there that is adjustable, uh, but be aware that, that that's a requirement that you have to meet. So 11263, uh, side hinge door hardware, Test with the hinges, representative locking, latching hardware installed and fully operable. Latching and locking configures shall be governed by national and local building codes, of course. Determination of the quantity and configuration of these devices on the tested assembly shall be the responsibility of the manufacturer, of course. All hardware shall meet the minimum requirements reference standards listed in table 11.2. There's a lot of hardware standards for doors that some people might not be aware of. And all of your components that go into a hinge door system that are referenced in this table have to be backed up by those standards that they comply to those. So again, you know, if you have a problem with a product and somebody happens to be smart enough to go looking at this stuff and challenge you on whether or not your components meet these requirements, you better hope that they do or you're gonna have bigger problems on how to deal with it and how to fix the problem. <clears throat> So hardware qualifying obviously comes in different forms and often not considered in the design work as the force to operate. So hardware like balance springs or casement levers must operate to listed forces uh, to their oper operational limits. So you can do this, uh, actually comment to that. So, so there are tables for different classes of products and different product types where there's force to initiate motion of that product as well as force to keep it moving. And this is oftentimes, I think people, manufacturers, when they go to testing, they might not understand that if you've got a really great slider product because it, boom, locks into the interlock, it's got really heavy weather strip, but man, to break that thing free takes a lot of effort. There's a requirement that you have to meet to be able to break that thing free to get it moving um, and then to keep it moving. So. There's a couple of tables that look at the different products. Uh, they provide the values of what you need to do. Same as casements, there's other products as well, uh, doors, et cetera. Um, and again, where, where the um, uh, pressure is put, as well as what the values are and how it's done. Um, the nice thing about that, actually, I'll, I'll mention that in a sec here. Uh, same thing with, with doors. So force is applied to latch. So force to latch test procedure. 
So uh, force, force the latch test should be performed with positioning the side hinge door leaf so the latch bolt is not farther than six inches from the strike plate. Force meter with a tether designed to stop travel, blah, blah, blah. Before the latch engagement occurs, it shall be applied perpendicular to the face of the door at one inch from the lock side door leaf. Anyway, it goes on to explain how that test is done, right? So nice thing about it, it's the same thing for um, applied to lock. So the force to engage the lock. So you have to be able to go back to that for a sec. Um, force testing to close the door. So to get it to latch, right? And then force testing to get it to lock. So there are two different tests. You've got to be able to close that door with a certain amount of pressure. And then you've got to be able to latch, latch that door, sorry, it's deadbolt or multi-point lock or whatever it is with a certain amount of pressure. And you can't go beyond that. And that can be really challenging when you're trying to get a door to meet air and water testing and to have that compression of your weather strips and all of your components working together to keep air and water out. Um, I wrestled with it many, many, many times in the lab trying to trying to hit those values just enough so that you can meet the requirements as well as meet the, the water penetration. So again, uh, after the door is latched, deadbolt should be engaged if necessary, forced to be applied perpendicular to the door leaf at the location specified in 6451 to facilitate the engagement of the deadbolt. Labs will typically also use that secondary motion on a multi-point system as your deadbolt force to latch, right? So that, that can be applied in both places or both product types. So the force should be measured and reported. In addition, the force or the torque to operate the deadbolt should be measured for, for deadbolts with the lever, push button, or similar mode of operation. The force should be measured applying a force gauge to the end of the device and direction of normal operation. So a, a multi-point multi lock system. Deadbolts with thumb turn, key turn, or similar rotating device. Torque should be measured applying torque gauge to the device. So the language out of 6451, come on, you can do it. There we go. Force meter with a tether designed to stop travel. Um, and it tells you where and how that's done. Should be applied perpendicular to the face of the door at a point 25 millimeters from the lock side, door leaf, blah, blah, three inches vertically from there. Force to operate, force to latch, and force to lock are easy to do in-house. And I strongly recommend doing that if you have that capability. Figure out that you've met those requirements with the compression of that system that you want to see in order to meet your air and water testing requirements. Um, doing it in the lab, obviously you burn up a bunch of time, which they love to charge you for. And it's easy to do as long as you understand what the requirements are and how it's done. It's not a difficult test to, to do. I learned that after doing it in the lab for several weeks. So door hardware water testing, this is often a question I get from members that are um, wrestling with uh, hardware that leaks. So 6422, the exclusion of water penetration through a side hinge door, dual action side hinge door, uh, system locking and latching hardware. <coughs> Excuse me. When evaluating side hinge doors and dual action side hinge door systems, water penetration through the locking latching hardware is permitted to be excluded provided the exclusion is clearly identified in the test report. So it has to be in there. If you've bagged off your hardware, they have to put that in the test report. Uh, should include a complete description of the exclusion method, how it was done, uh, as per clause 9.4. Statement shall also be included in the summary of the test report, uh, as per figure 9.6. Clearly identify the locking latching hardware which is excluded from the water penetration evaluation. Notwithstanding the affirmation exclusion, a product manufacturer wishing to evaluate the product including the locking latching, so not bagging off your hardware, um, the water penetration test with exterior latching hardware fully exposed to the water spray, no exclusion methods employed. In this case, obviously they don't need to say that it's been excluded, but they put the text in there to make sure people understand. A lot of people don't understand that when you label that door, if you bag the hardware in your product description in your labeling, you have to add an X behind the product description that that's been bagged off. You must do that. It's a requirement. So be aware that if somebody comes back and asks you about, well, how did your hardware do? Or why, why is my hardware leaking? Well, this is, this is how it was tested. This is the performance that we met. So a bit of a kind of a, a look at, at what the requirements would be for that. Um, it, it's interesting when you look at the examples in NAVS, they give you a limited water side hinge door X. So bagged off. And then they they reference it as limited water side hinge door. 
a bagged off hardware on a door is not a limited water door. It's, it's confusing how they've done this. So what you could do is if you have a door that's been tested to, and I've used 300 Pascals as an example and met that requirement, but you bagged off the hardware, that door meets 300 Pascals, but it's, the hardware's bagged and you have to add an X to your description. It's not a limited water rated door. Those are two different things. Limited water rated door means that that door has met um, water pressure less than the lowest, I think it's one, 180 Pascals, somewhere between zero, no pressure differential, and I think it's 180 or 150, I can't remember the exact number. And that's a limited water rated door, right? So the different things, and it's a bit confusing how this has been represented in NAVS. Um, so a bit of a side note, products that can be rated for limited water performance right now, NAF 17 has side hinge doors, dual action doors, and folding door systems. All of those can be tested for limited water. In NAF 22, they've added sliding doors to that, which was quite a surprise to me. I didn't know that was coming. This was all done before I joined the JDMG, uh, but it makes sense. Oftentimes, sliding doors are where hinge door systems are in, in buildings, patios, et cetera. So they've, in 22, unfortunately not referenced yet, we'll see it in NAF 25 or in NBC 25, uh, you'll be able to use the limited water rating for a sliding door, which is zero to 150 pascals of water pressure. Um, be useful if you've got doors under decks and things like that, and often that's the case, right? So it'll it'll certainly provide some leniency uh, to the sliding door market uh, when it comes to water penetration. Um, so aftermarket door hardware, another question that I get a lot. You know, I tested my door with X hardware, everything was great, you know, no problems at all, didn't leak, you know, the, the structural components all held up. Um, and then you ship the door out and somebody says, well, I'm gonna put my own hardware on it. Yeah, fill your boots, that's no problem. But it's responsibility of the specifier of the aftermarket hardware. That could be the project specifier, that could be the homeowner. That's who they are, the specifier of that hardware. It's up to them, to make sure that that hardware meets the same requirements of the hardware that was used in that door uh, to meet the performance grade that, that's been applied to that system. So it's up to them. So once you sold that door, it's essentially, it's not your problem. It may well be if the client comes back and says, look, I've got a problem. But if you can point to say, look, I tested with this hardware, you bought this you know, Home Depot door handle for whatever, 10 bucks, that's your issue. That's something that and you can show them that. This is right in NAFs that look, that we tested with this, you decided to use that, that's the problem. Happily sell you this other hardware if you want. So something to be aware of. Um, and of course, you know, obviously lots of different hardware. So substitution, this, this comes up often, um, often because we're all faced with supply chain where you can't get things, you wanna make an improvement, you wanna buy a product that maybe is more cost competitive, whatever it is, we all have a test report for a product and that test report can last five years maybe, whatever the time frame might be. There is no um, expiration date on a NAFS test, but there is when you think that as the building code updates, it references a new standard of NAFS. So in essence, there is an expiration date, but it's driven by the requirements of the national building code and the provincial adoption or the provincial um, codes that they write. Whatever version they refer to um, is the version that you need to be rated to. So if you have a test from 11 and now the code says 17, all your product needs to be tested to 17. Unless you can prove that there was no changes in the testing from 11 to 17 for that product, that can be pretty tricky to do. And some jurisdictions will simply say, I don't care. It needs to say 17. You got to go to your lab. Look, here's the product. We haven't changed anything. Can you rewrite this report and say that it ref it, it complies or conforms, I'm going to use, to 11 and 17. A lot of the testing that I did over the years, we did that. We had it to 08 and 11. All of our reports, for the most part, were written to reference both standards. Because you can also say, well, I tested to 11. That's better. Not necessarily. There might be something in 11 or in 8 or in 17 that is different that um, that could impact how that product was tested and what its outcome might have been. So 
a jurisdiction will say, we're enforcing 11. You show me a test report that says this conforms to 11 and then we're good. Everything else, you're dealing with engineers, you're dealing with your lab, et cetera. So make sure that whatever you're testing to is, is relevant. Um, so right now, if I was going to the lab right now with a product, I'd be talking to my lab saying, I want to test the 17 and 22. Because now you're good until, so we're going to see 22 in the NBC 25, which is going to be provincial 26, 27. That's going to run for five years. So now you're basically good until 31-ish, right? So something to be aware of. Make sure that you get your lab on board and, and test to the next standard. Be careful though, because if they're testing to 22, there might be something in 22 that is different than 17. And now you don't comply to 17, be careful. So talk it over with your lab, make sure you understand what those requirements are and how they go back and forth. And Annex D that I pointed out, the differences between them, as well as the uh, equivalency document from um, WDMA, FGIA, are good places to look to be able to cross-reference what those standards are. Uh, 22, uh, there's a change in 22 that dropped the, um, uh, what's it called? Um, latch rail load test. It's gone out of 22. But 17 still has it. So guys are trying to test the 22. This would typically be on a tilt and turn type product. They're trying to test the 22 where you don't have to test that, but 17 still has it. So if you don't have that test, you don't you don't conform and you wouldn't you wouldn't comply to the coming building code. Anyway, substitution. So let's talk about that a little bit more. General ideas, you get ratings for what you test, of course. Test reports are objective and only apply to the product design tested. Uh, any design modification or component substitution is not expected to retain the original ratings. So in order to formally qualify new product design, some labs offer two options. So you could retest, which of course, they're happy to do that for you, bring another product and we'll do it again. Deliverable will be a standalone objective test report for that new product design conduct an engineering evaluation to qualify in the new design for the original ratings. Uh, it's a separate document from the test report. Uh, also, it may or may not be possible depending on the modification requested. Sometimes these uh, evaluations need to be backed up by testing uh, when it's unclear to the lab on how that modification would affect the results. So for example, you want to put in a different hinge. Um, that hinge maybe doesn't have the AMA testing behind it. Um, maybe it's a different makeup, maybe it's got different anchor points, maybe it's got different studs, I mean, whatever it might be. A lot of labs are really hesitant to say, oh yeah, it's just a hinge, just swap it over, it's no big deal. Many will ask you to retest that, right? So it would, it would need to be tested unless engineering services is hired to perform an evaluation. Without data to provide evidence during the evaluation, the engineer performing it wouldn't have any data to support the replacement. Of course, I believe the conclusion would normally be to retest to determine if they perform better or equal to previous versions. I reached out to a couple of labs that I did a lot of work with over the years. Uh, they danced around this question a lot. Um, obviously, it's in their best interest to test again. Of course, makes sense. Uh, it's also in their best interest to test again because without an assurance that that change won't impact the performance, their test report is saying that your product meets this and you know they have to meet the requirements under the Standards Council of Canada. They just need to be really careful. So, you know, to that end, you know, I don't I don't blame them. I, I don't hold them to any contempt. I get it. They're they're trying to protect what they do. There's um as we go through this, at the end of the day, product compliance comes down to enforcement, don't we know? Because NAF's certification is not required in Canada, does everybody know that? I've had several companies ask me, look, I've got my certification report and uh, you know, my lab says this, your certification report, like, what do you mean? Well, you know, I'm well, my certification for my NAF testing. Well, okay, why'd you do that? Well, my lab told me I had to. Well, no, you don't. There is no requirement in Canada to certify your NAF testing. Canada, under the building code, is a self-declaration of your performance from a test from a from a lab. You could actually, if you had a if you had a setup in your facility of a, of a test lab or a test wall, you could test yourself and label and report. There's nothing in the building code that says you can't do that. I don't know who's doing it, but you could if you wanted to. If you had the technical ability and you had the equipment, 
you could actually do that because it's not required to be certified. So anyway, uh, building inspectors don't always dive deep into the details of NAF reports used for labeling. Manufacturers could potentially uh, be producing modified product designs for some time until being requested to retest or evaluate. Labs certainly have experienced dealing with manufacturers and trying to do that right thing and discuss the change with your lab before making those modifications. Um, I've done a lot of engineering evaluations with the labs over, over the years. Um, I've been successful in some, I've not been successful in others. Um, the, you know, the key when you go to do that is, is to be prepared. Whoops, go back one. So you wanna have the testing or certification documentation to the AMR or ANSI standard for that product. That's a great start because now you can say, look, this hinge that I used to use, here's the test AMA report for that. Here's the AMA report for my new hinge. The results are essentially the same. They might even be better in some cases. That's a great tool to start with because now you have a third party that's saying it's just as good, right? Samples of those two, whatever they are, you know, a couple of different hinges from different suppliers that, that you want to swap, um, you know, that can go a long way by looking at, you know, allowing them to look at how they're assembled, what the components are, what they feel like, uh, you know, their, their mounting spots, whatever it might be. Uh, test data from other manufacturers. This is a great one. If you have a good relationship with another manufacturer that's using that hardware and you have the AMA test reports or whatever, that's great because if they've tested a similar size or design, you can now kind of lean on that with your lab and say, look, it's been tested. It's been through that process. Um, some labs will buy into it. Some labs might say, well, you know, we, we don't know for sure that, that they've done that, but it's a great thing to have. So if you've got a good relationship, um, and I did that with some companies outside of our market area, uh, and we did it reciprocally. Sometimes I would send them stuff. Sometimes they'd send me stuff. Um, great to have those relationships uh, where you can, you know, work with another manufacturer to do that kind of stuff. And then of course, in-house test data. If, if you have that ability to do that testing internally, there are some labs that'll come and, and, and watch and witness that and you know accept it. All of it, again, goes back to the certification and non-certification question or, or requirement. Ultimately, you know, it, you're not in a certification program. Nobody beyond the building official, for the most part, I mean, you might run into an engineer or an architect, is looking for that stuff. I mean, the reality is if, if you go Let's say a building official, as an example, a building official says, well, I want to make sure that the hinges you used here are the same hinges that you tested with. Well, you know, my hinge supplier went out of business, so I had to change. But, you know, the test reports, were, we only did it last year. I don't want to spend another five grand. But here's what I did. Here's the hinges that I switched. Here's the AMA standard, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Most building officials are going to go, this guy obviously knows what he's doing. And they're going to say, yeah, architect, engineer. Most of them are going to say, you know, these guys understand the process. They understand how to address the change, um, and they're and they're being upfront. So there's ways to do it. Some guys just change. I mean, the reality is is sometimes you don't have a choice. You know, something gets discontinued or supply chain issues. You know, it just it is what it is. But if you want to stay on top of things, there are methods, retests, evaluations in-house evaluations, working with another partner, working with your hardware guys, they're happy to try and help you solve this problem. Right, Scott? Right, so, yeah. No, but it's essentially the same thing. What if I say no? No, go ahead. Oh, yeah, hang on, hang on, we wanna hear you. Here's your uh, shaving brush. You look like you need one there. Use yeah. <laughs> so uh, seals is a lot different than hardware and it's much simpler. Essentially, if you want to change a seal, be it a, a pile or a, a, you know, some type of a foam, as long as you're within 10% of the geometry of the original seal, you can typically get a waiver, no problem whatsoever. So that's 10% in terms of reach or pile length or anything like that. That's all there. Would it be a no-brainer with a lab? Would they just say, yeah, that's okay? Really? I'm a little bit surprised at that because, you know, water leakage obviously being what it is. Um, but I guess if you can prove 
geometry is the same, you know, density is the same. Yeah, okay, well, that's good to know. Swap your weather seals. <laughs> so WOCDs, everybody know what a WOCD is, window opening control device. That is a restrictor, essentially, an opening restrictor that is releasable. Uh, under uh, ASTM F2090, it requires two distinct actions, slide a button, push a button, whatever, two distinct actions to release it. When you open the window and then when you close it, it automatically re-engages. So now it's fall protection. Uh, it allows for egress. So anyway, um, in 2022, we talked about this because we were talking about the changes in the, uh, in the 2020 NBC that referred to WOCDs. So we uh, put, put together a task group with the folks at FGIA and WDMA to review it. Um, after the re review, it became clear that the 2020 NBC does not allow F2090 WOCDs for egress or fall protection. So be aware, if you're putting this on your product, it is not compliant under the 2020 National Building Code or what is gonna be adopted by the provinces. So FanCan, we've submitted a code change request. Unfortunately, it's for 2025 NBC. And at this point, uh, I checked the other day, there's over 2000 code change requests in the list right now to be reviewed. We're crossing our fingers that you, you can't, well, I shouldn't say you can't. It's very difficult to get your code change request bumped up the line. Everybody just puts them in and hopefully you can get it addressed. Uh, we are obviously pushing, we're asking, we're, we're talking to the folks at, um, at the code level saying this is a significant safety issue. We really want to try and get this addressed. We're working on it. Uh, so anyway, it, it is um, in that list for the 2025 cycle. The only region in Canada to allow these devices for fall, fall protection and egress is Quebec. They just did it under the last um, change that they did in their building code. Um, good for them because in my opinion, it's an excellent device. It solves a lot of safety issues where my experience and certainly a lot of other guys that I've talked with, you put on a restrictor for fall protection, obviously that negates any egress possibilities, but a lot of people remove these things. They just simply punch out the rivets or unscrew them or whatever. We see it all the time, apartment buildings, third floor, windows are open all the way. So our position in, in so we drafted a letter um, that we sent across the country to all of the provincial codes groups that were working on their versions under the 2020 NBC, explaining our concern and that this is an issue and we want to see you guys um, go against the 2020 NBC and allow these devices. Um, there was not one province that said, yeah, we'll do that, other than Quebec, which is already doing it. So they're, they're doing their own thing, which whatever, good for them. Uh, they are an ally and we're using that uh, as part of our argument that, look, it's already happening somewhere. Um, for the most part, every province came back and said, yeah, we understand what you're talking about. We we believe and we support what you're saying, that this is probably a good change. But for them to go against the National Building Code on a significant safety item, they're just not prepared at this point to do that. Now, the folks in BC, um, we've been talking with them. They have opened up a window, no pun intended. Uh, they do amendments every year after they adopt or after they draft their version of the, of the building code. So we're hoping to see them adopted in BC. Um, so they're going to bring in the BC building code spring of 2024. So maybe spring of 2025 in BC, we might see it. We've had a little bit of uptake from Alberta. Uh, Dave Goldsmith and I met with the folks at um, Building Safety Council, I think it is, of Alberta, presented to them. They were as well going, yeah, no, this makes sense. So we do have some support out there, and we're trying to stay on top of these guys saying, look, we get that you can't do it now, but when can you do it? Can you do an amendment? And Alberta does. They do amendments every year where they change. Um, I think I referenced it here, actually, where they, they make small tweaks to what they've done to the Alberta Building Code every year, right? So we're pushing that. Um, Atlantic Canada, same thing, some support from, from that region. Uh, so 
we're working on it, but just be advised that that device is not compliant for fall protection. So if you put one on a window and some kid or the, the parent opens the window and the kid falls out, be prepared to have some lawyers calling on you. So just be aware. Now, if you have a window that is above 900 millimeters, we're talking in a residential building, a dwelling unit, above 900 millimeters, um, and not an egress situation, so not in a bedroom or something like that. But the, the client wanted these for whatever their reasons might be. I mean, they've got kids that are good climbers or something. You could use that because there is nothing governing that window, right? It's not required for egress. It's not required to meet fall protection. So you could use them in that case where a client wants to protect that window, but they also want to be able to open it. So you could use them in that case. But be aware, not compliant for egress or fall protection. Uh, so again, blah, 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 uh, we, we did this, we have a CCR in the works. Um, so 11.222, 2017 references WOCD devices as, as devices compliant. Sorry, I, I wanna make sure I get this. Yeah, here we are. So in 2020 NBC, it actually says this in the annex. So the annex to the building code is just um, non-normative, non non-normative, non-formative. It, it's not part of the code, it's just, suggestions and descriptions and information. Some architects and de designers will look at it as being something that they can work with. So, but it's not code specific enforceable language. But what they did, examples of WOCDs that can limit window openings to a maximum of hundred millimeters as required by clause 9881 include, but are not limited to fixed stop levers, fixed like Absolutely not. That is 100% incorrect. So, they've changed that. So they've removed the reference to WOCD because if I read that, I'd say, oh, well, they must be, they're okay. They must be okay to use. It says right there that they're referencing this type of device. They've changed this now to say mechanism. They've removed the reference to WOCDs. So I know that I'm kind of harping on this one a little bit, but it's a, it's a big deal. I think you could really run into some serious issues if, if not that they would ever do this, but if your hardware supplier was telling you it was compliant, and you put them on, on their word, you're the one that's gonna end up in a serious situation if something was to happen. So I really wanna drive home that, and I know that the hardware guys might not love me on that because it takes away a device they can sell, but it's, <laughs> it's a big deal. <laughs> so just be aware that, that that's a, it's a really big deal. We're working on it the best we can from the backside, from the code change request side, uh, trying to get this change. And again, uh, Quebec allowing these uh, is a great ally and they have their argument that we've included in, in our argument as well. A uh, little bit of an Alberta code update. Um, so 2023 Alberta edition is expected to publish this fall. I don't have a date yet. Uh, Paul Chang up in Edmonton, who we saw at Nicole's um, place last year, whenever that was, um, from the Ministry of Alberta, did a presentation on this. He still doesn't have an exact date, but he says it's coming this fall. You're going to see it. It's going to publish. You'll be able to get a, a an early view of it uh, and then be adopted. So it'll publish in the fall and then be adopted in the spring. They have until March the 23rd to adopt it. That, that was the requirement when the NBC was published. Everybody, all the provinces had two years from the published date of the NBC to their version, be it the adopted NBC or their version of their building code. So the Alberta building code, um, virtually no changes to window requirements and door requirements um, from, the, from what's in the NBC 2020 to what Alberta is gonna do. So if you have the NBC 2020, look at all the window and door stuff, it's all the same. There's no changes there. Um, oh, something else of interest. I picked this up the other day. We had, a, we had an event in Moncton. Um, we had a building official there uh, from Moncton that was talking about what they're doing. Um, they're, they're pushing their adoption back to 2025, spring 2025. I don't know how they can do that because there is a legal requirement for the provinces to do this. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out and what it does in other regions. If other regions go, well, they did it, so we're going we're gonna to wait. I, I don't know how, the, how that's going to play out. So the uh, NBC 23... I don't know if it's going to be 23 or 24. I think it's 23 Alberta edition based on the uh, code 2020 changes me the NBC that effect. Well, I already said that. So incorporated into the Alberta edition. 
no window and door changes from NBC 2020 to the Alberta edition 2023 or 24. Uh, this is a great website if uh, obviously people here in Alberta provides useful web fight, the website for information on their code interpretations. So in, in BC, um, the Building Officials Association of BC has a code interpretation committee. So if you have, um, what's a good example? Uh, guard load glazing. I had a question about, you know, what the requirements are and where it needs to be, et cetera. You can send that into that committee and they will provide you a written response of their interpretation. Unfortunately, it can take anywhere from four weeks to six months, unfortunately. But uh, but it, again, the nice thing is, is that they also have a website with all of them there. So if you have something that, you know, what about this? You can jump onto that website and have a look. This is very much the same thing, where they have a group that looks at code inquiries and interpretation requests, and then provides provides a um, um, interpretation uh, of it can be really handy can also bite you in the butt too right sometimes if it doesn't go your way right but anyway it's a great site check it out uh, lots of really good information there uh, you can oh yeah and you can subscribe to it as well so if something new comes you can get an email that says hey but you know if it's relevant to you then you can go check it out if it isn't obviously uh, don't worry about it so 2025 NBC activity. So I mean, we don't even have the 2020 in place yet. And of course, lots of work already happening on 2025. There's, there's, there's a lot going on in 2025 and 2030 is gonna be even crazier. Uh, I'm, I'm sitting uh, currently monitoring all of these different standing committees and task groups that are working on um, the changes to the NBC 2025. There are a lot of window and door things in there um, things like uh, solar heat gain limits based on window to wall ratios, um, entry door widths, right? So if you have an entry door, it has to be um, 850 millimeters, which is under discussion. Sorry, I don't, it doesn't have to be. That's something that's under discussion right now. Uh, they're saying that a standard 3.0 door meets that. It actually doesn't meet it by about an eighth of an inch or two and a half millimeters depending on how you measure it and where that door is. Um, at 90 degrees, it's really close, like really close, like within, like I say, depending on your tolerances, I mean, some guys building, you know, if their door frame is an eighth of an inch wider, you make it. If it's an eighth of an inch narrower, you don't make it. So it's really, really tight. So we're part of the discussions that I've been having with that group is, look, why have it so tight? Why not give us 800 and whatever? 40 millimeters or whatever it is so that everybody knows that a standard three foot 35 and three quarter inch slab is going to meet it at 90 degrees. My next question is where have you ever seen an entry door that only opens 90 degrees? I mean, I don't know that I've ever seen one that's like that. You usually get hundred, maybe 110, sometimes 180, depending on what the situation is. So anyway, those kinds of conversations are going on. So energy efficiency, obviously, today's world, there's a lot of conversation going on on energy efficiency, requirements for thermal performance for windows and doors. The solar heat gain one is, it's a big one, depending on where you are. Well, it's a big one to everybody, but the position changes as you move around the country. In BC, adamantly against solar heat gain, like adamantly. Every manufacturer that I know uh, in BC, that's probably not fair. Most manufacturers want low caps on solar heat gain because of our conditions that we've experienced in the last few years. You know, I mean, 40, 49 degrees, I think it was in June, 2021 in Lytton and Chilliwack was like 46. I mean, that, it's unheard of those temperatures. Well, obviously those temperatures equate to significant solar gain, right? And we saw 600 plus extra people die in one week. Now, where were they? apartment buildings that are 40 years old with clear glass windows. I mean, there's lots of debate about, well, you know, why should we do this? Why should we have it? Okay, sure, those buildings were 40 years old and they're old buildings, but that shouldn't stop us from saying, well, let's do better today so that in 40 years, that's a better building. Anyway, I don't want to get on a soapbox about that, but solar heat gain is a huge item across the country. Quebec lives and dies on it, 45 50 solar heat gain, happy to sell it like that. So anyway, 
we're going to see caps on it. I'm, I'm almost positive. What I have seen is 17% um, wooded wall ratio, uh, uh, 0 .40, 0 0.40, 0.45, 0.40, 17 to 22, forgive me on the numbers, 0.4 maybe. And then over 22, 0.26. So that's a pretty big drop, but it makes sense. If you've got 22% plus, solar gain on a south or um, elevation, sorry, 22% window to wall ratio on a south exposed elevation, that's a lot of glass, sucking in a lot of heat from the sun. There's also gonna be a requirement, I expect that we'll see it in the 2025, where you have to maintain a certain temperature in at least one room in the house. BC is, uh, they've selected 26 degrees Celsius. One room can't go above 26 degrees however they're gonna do that. So that's also coming. So again, we talk about solar heat gain, high performance windows. Um, another impact of high solar gain on triple glaze, high performance, low U value windows. The thing that I'm seeing, I was on a call the other day, there was a passive house project in Vancouver, passive house, some of the best performing buildings in the in the world. They, got, they can't keep it cool. Air conditioners are running 12 months a year because 0.5 solar gain and like a 1.02 U-value. The heat pours in and can't get out. Whereas older homes, clear glass or maybe, you know, one, one high solar gain in a dual glaze, it gets in, but it also gets out in the evening. But these buildings are so efficient, they suck in all this heat and then they can't get rid of it. Anyway, Passive House is having big problems in British Columbia, as well as around the Toronto region, I've heard, with overheating of buildings. Are Dual glaze, one high solar gain, low E. Yeah, it's an energy star window. And meanwhile, you value your 1.22. I mean, you know, central Canada, man, they live and die on ER. They do. Yeah. And energy star. But energy star, you know, off the table, off the record have said, look, we're pushing our U values down. We're at 122 now. The next version coming, I don't know when, 26, 27 maybe, is probably going to be 105 as a baseline, probably. That's kind of where I see it going. At that point, you're, you're, you know, getting into an ER value is getting more and more difficult. So BC has never used ER. It's never been a, it's never been a, a path for, for meeting any of the energy performance goals other than through Energy Star. But uh, good thing Cam's not here. Cam, our, our current president, thermal-proof windows on the island. I mean, boy, you listen to him about Solar Heakin because he's a renovation company for the most part. And he goes to his clients and says, look, I want to give you an Energy Star window. It's triple glaze, 1.22, you know, medium solar heat gain, like a 0.3, maybe something like that. This is the best window that you can have where you are. But I can go to Home Depot and buy it for a third of the price. A dual glazed, high solar gain, energy star window. They don't understand. So he's fighting that battle all the time. So, I mean, when I, I was, oh man, I could go on about solar heat gain all day. I was uh, in a meeting with the energy efficiency group talking about this item. And my, my point and my debate was, there is no appropriate solar heat gain number that you can apply across the board. It's every building, every single building and every design every glazing um, window to wall ratio, everything that your solar heat gain should be based on the, the parameters around that project. Because you're right, you could use a 0.45 solar heat gain on low window to wall ratio in a certain climate zone. I mean, sure, why not? Makes sense. But yeah, it's the discussions are endless about this. It's really something to listen to. It's great. Yeah, if you haven't seen that on our website, uh, Al Yagelis has been doing this. He actually just did it for the guys at BC Back a couple of weeks ago. Very well received. So Al talks about the equation of performance and comfort. And he really gets into the impacts of different solar gain values and U values. And one of the really interesting things that he talks about, and, and what he did was really interesting is what he did is he said, okay, you take the solar heat gain value of X, a picture window under NFRC. 
four feet by five feet, standard model size, 0.35, whatever it might be. But that window in the building now is seven feet by whatever, pick a number. It's three or four or five times the size. Well, that solar heat gain now isn't 0.3. It's like 0.5 or something like that, whatever the number is. For every meter, square meter of glazing at that value, he was able to equate it to watts of energy. I can't remember what the exact numbers. It's on our website, so you should go and watch it if, if you haven't. It's really interesting. So he's like, you take this product. That would be like setting a 1,500-watt hair dryer in this room in the worst point of summer, the hottest day, and letting it run all day. Why would you do that? Anyway, it's a great session. Um, Al's such a great, uh, great presenter that if you get an opportunity, check it out. Yeah. Is any of this going to be elevation based? even though windows are ER rated instead of one forty. Yeah. Higher no. Rate, so where's the risk? Not that I've seen. No, no reference to elevation. Climate zones, yes, but they don't take that into account. Now, I I do know that. I need to dig into it, but there are some right. very few cases where the zone does change just because of the elevation, whether or not it's in areas that you're thinking about, I, I'd have to dig into. Right. Um, anyway, so several code groups uh, sitting in. Um, if you've got the time, you should check some of these out. They're open to the public. Um, shoot me a note, I can hook you up to how to how to get connected to the ones that you want to be involved in. So there's energy efficiency, housing, small buildings, use and egress. Uh, this is a great one. Task group on the consequences of high performance buildings. A lot of solar heat gain talk there. Uh, this is just the advisory council. That one's actually cl um, closed. It's, it's full for lack of a better way. And then fire protection. There's some others as well, but not really relevant to what we do. But they're open to the public. They're code discussion committees. And anybody can sit in as a... Um, um, viewer that's the word i'm looking for not a member but a participant or observer thank you yeah so yeah you can sit in now the challenge is oftentimes they're three or four hours long and there's about 20 minutes that are relevant to you and they don't always follow their agendas so you might spend all day watching it but if you're interested it's a great place to go and sit to get a get a better understanding of code development for 36 years i was a code user Sitting on this side of the fence, it's a completely different world. I'm I'm nowhere near an expert on the code development world, but it's really interesting, and I'm starting to starting to wrap my head around it. Uh, it can also be extremely frustrating listening to conversations about where to put a a handbar in a shower for two hours. So it can really really go on. Anyway, really cool. If you're interested, shoot me a note, and I can get you connected. Uh, Energy Star participants in here, everybody in Energy Star. Probably most, I think most guys are. Do you have your 2023 Energy Star participation agreement that you've submitted? Be careful. Be careful. Received information from a member a few months back about the new participant agreement from Energy Star. Um, this new PA covers the period from 2023 to 2024 and is a requirement for participation. You have to agree to this. If you want to be in the program, you have to sign it. There's no, you can't get around that. Um, a lot of it is the same. A lot of it hasn't changed, of course, but a lot of people were missed. Um, once I started putting this out, that this thing was happening, I was getting inquiries from members going, what are you talking about? Well, we haven't seen anything. Unfortunately, everybody knows about all of the staff changes. Well, Intercan had a list of emails and they just sent them to those people. Lots of them were gone, right? So a lot of companies didn't get it. So if you haven't seen this, um, again, you can reach out to me or you can reach out to the folks at Energy Star to get uh, to get your copy. <clears throat> so we pushed it out to the members via eblast uh, as well as on our website. Uh, so there's a couple of things in the new uh, participant, participant agreement. Participant is required to submit unit shipment data starting on March 1st of the previous calendar year annually or as requested, I don't know what that means, by Enercan starting in the 2024 or 2023 March 1st shipments. You have to track what you ship for Energy Star and report it to Energy Star. That's brand new. I've, that's it's new. It's new in their program. The states has been doing that for a while under the U.S. Energy Star, but this is new and it's a, a requirement for you to do that if you're in the program. So, 
uh, I had a member, it was actually an American member that contacted me about it when it first dropped because I didn't see this, didn't come to me. Um, and he's like, well, how, what, what do we need to do? So I reached out to Energy Star. Ah, oh, we don't have it sorted out yet. But you need to start tracking it March 2023. So we're working with the folks at Energy Star. They've experienced what many of you have. The Energy Star Fenestration Manager has changed four times in the last two years. There's a new guy in there now. His name is Jude Ellis, I believe it is. Uh, he's very receptive. He doesn't know windows and doors. He's looking for support. So I'm you know, developing, developing a relationship with him at the same time telling him, look, you guys really messed this up. You need to sort this out so that our members know what they're supposed to do. Well, all they need to do is keep track of Energy Star products they ship and non-Energy Star products they ship. What? Well, it's as simple as that. No, no, Jude, that's not simple. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. Why do you want to know what they've not shipped? Well, so that we have a ratio of the amount of product shipped. That kind of makes sense. I get it. But if it's not Energy Star, why do I need to tell you? Anyway, I'm not going to get into all of that. It's going to be an electronic portal that's not ready. I haven't seen it. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what the parameters are that you need to put in there. But you're going to have to do it if you want to participate. No ifs, ands, or buts. In the U.S., they were able to work with U.S. Energy Star and have um, a process set up where participants could work with WDMA and FGIA to have them do it. So we proposed that to Energy Star Canada. Could Fenestration Canada set up something to work with our members and participants, and we would handle that? No. What about the U.S. version? Could they do it? No. We've worked a lot. This is Energy Star speaking to me. We've worked a lot on this portal. This is going to be the process. This is going to be how you're going to have to input that data. Well, what data? Oh, we don't know yet. We're working on that. So I'm on them about once a week. I reach out to them saying when, when, when. I've asked them to come online with me to do a tech talk to, you know, tell them what we're, tell everybody what we're doing, allow questions from our members. They keep pushing me back because they're not quite ready yet. Um, it's going to be, uh, it might be easy. It may be really simple. Uh, it may also get a whole lot of garbage data, which is probably my bigger concern. Oh, I need to put in, oh, I did 5,000 US or 5,000 Energy Star and 2,000 non Energy Star. Done. Who can check? Who's going to know? Not that I'm promoting that we don't put in the proper data because it's good data. It's useful if we can get that. And then they give us data back on what's going on in Energy Star. So it's great data to be able to have. But the process is really challenging, not finished. He's telling me that they're going to have this portal ready soon within the next month or two, he said. And at that point, he tells me that he will come online with me and we'll do a online webinar, go through and explain what the process is. What he did say is you will not need to break your product down by ER, by U value, by door, window, value, whatever. It'll simply be, I shipped 5,000 Energy Star products and I shipped 2,000 non-Energy, whatever those are. That'll be it. I don't know. I haven't seen it, so we'll see. But you got to do this. So just be aware that you might want to set up something where you can track this information just so you've got it. Um, and then the other one, and this, this it surprised me because I never picked up on it in the past, but this is something that's been in the Energy Star program at least since the last agreement and potentially before that. Um, participant must adhere to uh, product verification testing. Participant must adhere to third party certification requirements, which of course you do. If you're under NFRC or CSA, which you have to be, you do. Well, I hope you do. Including verification testing, whether selling products in the US or in Canada. Well, okay, well, hang on a second. What does that mean? What does that mean? In CSA, it's all computer simulation. You don't have to do verification testing. NFRC, you do, you do physical testing. So what does that actually mean? Well, if you flip to the next page of this participant agreement at the top, and it's kind of, if you're not watching, you actually skip over it, which I did the first time. Uh, so this is in the additional commitments. 
well, why not just put it in the original commitments? But there are additional commitments now. Send fenestration model samples to a specified test lab for the purposes of verification testing where requested by Entercan. So if Entercan calls you up and says, look, model number XXXX sliding window, I want one of those. Send it to whoever, they're gonna do thermal modeling. You have to do it, stay in the program. That is not new, but it's never been done in Canada that I'm aware of. I've never seen it. I've never been asked to do it. I don't know anybody in Canada that's actually done that for Energy Star. I know Steve Hopwood, many of you probably remember him, Energy Star's manager for many, many years. He talked about it a lot, but he said that they, they're not doing it. They're not prepared to do it. They don't, you know, blah, blah, blah. I think that it has something to do with the U.S. Energy Star program because Canada is the baby of the U.S. Energy Star program. And there's requirements in the U.S. program through the EPA that there's things they have to do. And I think that that's where that came from. So it's coming. It'll be random. I don't know what they'll ask for. I don't know what the leniency tolerances are going to be. If you got a 1.45 and you get a 1.49, is that okay? I don't know. Anyway, again, trying to get information on that to clear up. And that'll be one of the things that I'll be asking him to speak to once I can get them online with me to talk about it. So if you haven't signed your agreement yet, first off, you're late because it was supposed to be in on the 29th, I think. We got a bit of an extension from them, but it needs to be in, you have to do it. If you haven't done it, technically, they can remove your listings from the Energy Star site and then from the Greener Home site. So be aware, it's a requirement to be in that program. <clears throat> And then I try to push this because it, it annoys me a little bit. Uh, Fenestration Canada set up an online forum. So on our website, we've got a Q&A forum. Um, I really would like to see more activity. It started out pretty good. We've got a few people jumping in. Um, all it is is you can go in and pose a question, whatever it is. doesn't matter. Something, obviously... You know, don't ask me what the weather's going to be, but something about products, codes, NAFs, whatever. It doesn't matter. But obviously, fenestration relevant. Um, I get notified right away as soon as that question goes in. Uh, and then I will find you an answer, whatever it might be. Usually, I'm pretty good. Within 48 hours, I've got something for you. If it's going to be longer than that, I'll respond. And the response will go here. And you'll get notified that there's a response. Um, and the nice thing about it is that as we build this Q&A database, you can go and check it out. If you've got a question or you can search stuff, you can tag um, topics where you can follow a conversation. It's a great little tool to be able to share stuff, to find information, to pose questions. So I really encourage you, if you're not already on it, go to our website. It's under our uh, tech center. Um, let me see if even... So if you go to the technical center on our homepage, uh, you drop down, There's it's forum. You go in, uh, you can sign into things, you can ask for, um, like, uh, su subscribe to get uh, new updates, whatever it is. There's a couple of different parameters in there. So I really would love to see it get used more. It's a great tool for me because oftentimes I'll get an email or a phone call from a member asking me a question and I'll give them the answer, but I won't give it to anybody else because obviously that, you know, it's not realistic for me to try and reach out to everybody. But if I do it here, Everybody's got that information. If it's obviously sensitive, then I'll respond, you know, through email or something to the member, right? I won't, you know, if whatever it is, if it's sensitive, it won't be on here. But if it's a general question about what about guard load glazing, I think that that's in here. Got into talking about the requirements for guard load glazing. Easy to find. You can search, you can save stuff, you can like things, whatever, right? So anyway, I'd love it to see more people on there. Um, feel free to browse it whenever you like for what's there now. And um, again, would love to see you guys um, use this. So I love doing this stuff. I love getting out and meeting with the guys that, that we serve. Um, it's what I love to do now. Um, everybody, everybody kind of bugs me a bit about how much I, who was, well, Scott was saying, yeah, we keep hearing how much you like doing this, but it's true. I love doing this. I love talking to you guys. I love, imparting my knowledge of this industry and learning from you guys, talking to guys across the country. There's lots of great things that go on. Um, you know, a guy in Atlanta, Canada might have an issue that, 
you know, would help you out that, that you're not competing with them so you can share. It's great. I love doing it. I love being uh, on the road uh, doing this kind of stuff. Uh, we're going to do more of it. We've talked about doing uh, some cross country um, things where we would do like a road show, go across the country and do some different um, educational type things. So I want to hear from you guys. Tell me what it is that you want me to do. All of you guys pay me. You guys are paying my salary right now. So if I don't have the answer, I'll find you the answer. So please, I'm your resource. Use me as much as you want in my time frame that I work, which is already Tuesday to Thursday, right? Tuesday to Thursday. What day is it today? No, I can, you know, I'm on today. It's good. I'm on a work day today, so it's great. Yeah. NBC 2023. I've not heard no anything about when they're going to adopt. Okay. Um, I know that Manitoba does some amendments. Yep. They don't write their own, obviously. They adopt the NBC with amendments, kind of similar to what Alberta does. But I've not seen a timeline. I've not seen amendment lists. None of that. Manitoba is supposed to adopt by March 23rd of 2024. Yep. That's the requirement under the harmonization agreement federally. So that's what they're, yep. that's what they're legally required to do. But New Brunswick is already saying, oh, yeah, no, we're not going to, we're going to do what we want to do. And we're going to push it back a year, which really surprised me, really surprised. Me. And I don't know why. I don't know that they're making big changes or I don't know. Now I think that, what did he say to me? They're still under uh, like the 2010 or something like that. Like they're way back there. So maybe it's because of all of the changes yep. between those versions. That could be. Um, so yeah, Saskatchewan, I, you know what? I have no idea, to be honest. I get very little sort of feedback from Saskatchewan. So I'd love to have more. I'd like to connect with the codes people there and find out this what they're the doing. School, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> get, exactly. Gotta no, we, info, we yeah. got to keep yeah. them involved and yeah. you need to find ways to do that for sure. So um, yeah, that's... Um, that's it. Um, Terry at fenestrationcanada.ca. By all means, email me anytime. Um, you can phone me. Um, if I don't recognize a number, I probably won't answer it. So leave me a message and I'll call you back uh, quickly. And I oftentimes don't turn my ringer on in the morning for some reason. So email me, go to the forum, post questions, love to see stuff like that. Um, and then anything else we can do, if you've got topics that you want to hear about, you know, next time we're out, um, I don't know that we have, we don't have a date yet. Windor, obviously coming up. If, if you're not going to Windor, uh, you should. Uh, the show floor is full. It's going to be great. Uh, obviously, the main event um, uh, dinner is going to be five or 600 people, something like that. That's always a good time. Uh, I think I've got um, nine education sessions, some really good sort of different. Um, we're going to have the folks from... Uh, uh, Canadian Federation of Independent, Independent Business are going to be there doing a session. If you're a member of FinCAN, you're a member of CFIB, in case you don't know that. It's a pretty good deal. It's like a $700 a year fee that you don't have to pay. Um, we're going to be talking about um, silicones. We're going to be talking about um, embodied carbon. That's going to be a really good one. We've got the folks from uh, Half, Half Life Carbon are going to be there doing a session. Um, Sherwin Williams, I'm working on getting them in on doing a coding session. Hopefully that's okay with Colin. Is he Colin here? I don't know that I've met him. He's at his facility? Yeah. Uh, what else? He's <laughs> flipping burgers. Um, what else? Anyway, it's going to be good. I've got, I think I've got nine sessions um, that hopefully will be enticing and interesting. So I'd love to see you guys at Windor. It's a great time, great show. So... There you go. That's all I've got for you today. Yeah, I don't know what the, uh, did I get the address on that? So we're we're going over to Western Color, uh, Western Color and Codings. Um, I don't know what the address is. Somebody here will have it. Uh, and he's going to give us a tour and talk a little bit about what they do. And he's going to give us lunch. It's flipping burgers. All right. Thanks. Thanks again, guys. I really appreciate it.